This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you all for being here this afternoon and for joining us for the final talk in this year's Chancellor's Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series. The Colloquium Series, as you know, because I've seen many of you uh, who come often to these uh, presentations, invites renowned leaders in government, industry, the performing arts, and higher education to engage with our campus community about their work and about major issues that we face in higher education, but also in the country in general. And of course, around the world, we had many speakers who extended their talks to um, incorporate those concerns. I'm so pleased today to have with us the President and William T. Golden, Chair of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Leslie Berlowitz. Leslie will speak about liberty and learning. Afterwards, she will be joined by Maureen Stanton, Vice Provost of Academic Affairs, who will ask a few questions and then will moderate the discussion with the audience. First, I would like to introduce our moderator this evening, Vice Provost Maureen Stanton, and then I will introduce our speaker. Maureen joined the UC Davis faculty nearly 30 years ago and has become one of the world's, the world's most influential evolutionary ecologists. Maureen is a recipient of the UC Davis Top Teaching Prize in 2005 and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012. Maureen's research focuses on how plant and animal populations adapt to environmental change caused by natural processes or human activities. This is critical knowledge for predicting the long-term consequences of climate change, biological invasions, and other alterations of global ecosystems. So, Mo, thank you so much for agreeing to Thanks play this role today. Thank you. Now, I'm very honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Leslie Berlowitz. Leslie is the first woman to serve as Chief Executive Officer of the Academy and was named its 55th, 45th President in 2010. The Academy was founded in, in 1780 and um, I was really impressed myself when I visited uh, the building to look at all of the signatures and acceptance letters of the many, many members the Academy has um, recognized. And I would like to say that among the many members early um, in the Academy, you can find Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. It's a great organization. It's an independent policy center whose membership includes scientists, scholars, artists, actors, policymakers, and very accomplished individuals from all sides of life. In this critical role at the Academy, Leslie has been at the forefront of recent efforts to assess the state of the humanities and social sciences and their impact on the country's education system, economic competitiveness, and cultural diplomacy. Before joining the Academy in 1996, Leslie served as Vice President at New York University. So it is a great honor, Leslie, to have you here with us. And I will now turn the stage over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Katei, for your very warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here at the University of California, Davis, whose extraordinary work spans from strength in culture to strength in viticulture. As Nobel Prize winning scientist Alexander Fleming once said, penicillin cures, but wine makes people happy. 
when Chancellor Katehi invited me to travel from the rocky cold coast of New England to visit this beautiful campus, and the weather has just been extraordinary today. What a greeting. I was very happy indeed, and that's even before the wine reception. So it is my honor to be with you today. The title of my talk, Liberty and Learning, is taken from James Madison's 1822 letter to W.T. Barry, a Kentucky congressman, senator, and Andrew Jackson, postmaster general. In praising the state of Kentucky's new plan for a general system of public education, Madison wrote, quote, what spectacle can be more edifying or more seasonable than that of liberty and learning, each leaning on the other for their mutual and surest support? Like so many of his revolutionary colleagues, including his friend and mentor, Thomas Jefferson, and his political rival, John Adams, Madison believed that a well-rounded education and a more general diffusion of knowledge would be the best security against crafty and dangerous encroachments on the public liberty." Unquote. To preserve the public liberty, Madison also championed education as the bedrock of democracy and argued for the creation of learned institutions, which he believed ought to be the favorite objects with all people. One such learned institution, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, was founded in 1780 by John Adams, James Bowden, John Hancock, and several of Madison's revolutionary colleagues, precisely for the purpose of advancing, quote, the wealth, peace, independence, and happiness, unquote, of the young republic. Like Madison, the founders of the American Academy certainly understood the importance of instrumental learning. In its early years, the Academy assisted in the pursuit of useful knowledge by publishing surveys of the soils, plants, and minerals of North America, the raw materials that would be the basis for America's growth and prosperity. But they also left a legacy of support for curiosity-driven scholarship that continues to inspire work across this nation and the innovations that we draw from. Adams, Jefferson, Franklin, and Bowdoin were practical men. They were lawyers, businessmen, journalists, statesmen. Adams was also a farmer. I think he would have loved it out here. And they were very practical. They understood the importance of imagination in the arts as well as in sciences to the national enterprise. And they brought this conviction to their government work, which helped to shape democracy. The American Academy was founded before there was a country. In fact, in 1780, they were just working on the Constitution, both of the United States and of the Massachusetts. And Adams wrote into the Constitution of Massachusetts, which he was able to be the most persuasive author, that every state should have an academy. Uh, he did not, he did not, excuse me, he wanted to get into the American Constitution that every state should have an academy. Uh, that didn't quite make it into the American Constitution, but he was able to keep it into, in the Massachusetts Constitution. I've been thinking about these men and their commitment to curiosity, to the sciences and the humanities, and I fear that America is losing sight of that broad intellectual ideal. As you all know, curiosity-driven research and education is an easy target for policymakers in times of fiscal constraint. In recent months, general knowledge has been challenged from several angles. Congress has debated the efficacy of funding the social sciences and very recently restricted the National Science Foundation for projects that will, if they do not, quote, promote national security or the economic interests of the United States, unquote. One hopes that this will change in successive administrations, but it is a very instrumental and narrow definition of uh, the na that is being imposed on the National Science Foundation, and there is some fear that it will also be imposed on the National Institutes of Health. Uh, it flies in the face of the peer-reviewed 
broader curiosity driven uh, way that we have carried out science and social sciences in this country. Other signs that alarm me. Some state governors have encouraged college students to avoid humanistic and social scientific disciplines. I mean, this raises to the state that a governor can say in one state that he thought, he thought students should be charged more to study history because it was not going to lead to a useful career. Um, some states have even instituted laws requiring colleges to post the incomes of their students one year after graduation as if the immediate benefit of college education were that value one year out of college. I wouldn't have done very well if that had been the way my life had been evaluated. And I don't know if how any of you feel about that. Now, of course, the public's reasonable desire for accountability is, is, re, is something that is more and more being spoken about with the high costs of education. But this kind of calculation, one year out of college, is very misleading and even a self-defeating set of measures for education, just as measuring teachers, K through 12, on the performance of their students can have dire effects on the curriculum. America's te technical and cultural preeminence was not based on such a constricted and impoverished view of intellectual enterprise. Vannevar Bush, as chairman of the National Defense Research Committee and director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, understood the importance of research to the economic and political well-being of this nation. He led or oversaw several unique major research projects designated specifically to ensure that America would prevail, most notably the Manhattan Project. But Bush also recognized that knowledge for the sake of understanding was the most important stimulus of discovery. Unpredictable, inconvenient, occasionally inefficient, such research and scholarship is the key to innovation, as Archimedes, Isaac Newton, and Alexander Fleming all would testify. In 1967, well after the World War II period in which Bush uh, not only worked on the Manhattan Project, but also led, his work led to the creation of the National Science Foundation, he published a, a reflective and sobering book with the provocative title, Science is Not Enough, in which he wrote, knowledge for the sake of understanding, not merely to prevail, that is the essence of our being. None can define its limits or set its ultimate boundaries. Even as American Academy projects gather evidence on the practical importance of advanced research for government, industry, and civic culture, they also champion the pursuit of knowledge, as do most universities in this country. Knowledge for the sake of understanding, as well as knowledge for prosperity that's more direct. Earlier this month, the Academy released a new report, Arise Two unleashing America's research and innovation enterprise. ARISE stands for Advancing Research in Science and Engineering. The report advocates for greater integration of theories, concepts, and applications from multiple scientific disciplines, biology, physics, medicine, engineering, computer science, to solve the complex problems of the 21st century. It offers recommendations to foster collaborative research between academia, universities, and industry. Chancellor Katehi was a who, as she herself mentioned, is a fellow of the Academy. She was an important part of that study. That study leads us now to how do we implement that study. And an important challenge for all of us is how will we evaluate people who do interdisciplinary research? How will their careers move along in the spectrum? And these are new challenges to universities that I think none of us want to shrink back from. Next month, the Academy's Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences will begin a multi-year public campaign 
to argue for the critical role of the humanities and social sciences to, quote, achieve long-term national good for our intellectual and economic well-being, for a stronger, more vibrant civil society, and for the success of cultural diplomacy. As a student of the late 60s and early 70s, the notion that the humanities would take up the challenge of industry, economic well-being, and military diplomacy would have been something of a surprise. And yet, it's clear to me, and I hope to many of you, that you can't argue for public support if you can't make the case for the public good, especially during constrained economic times. Both of these projects, the ARISE project and the Humanities project, advocate for the importance of research across the disciplines. Both acknowledge the need to combine disciplines, to merge them in new ways, to take the tools of science and the humanities to address grand challenges, and both also seek ways to nurture young talent and support senior faculty as they chart the frontiers of their fields together and make new alliances. As some of you may know, the commission answers a bipartisan call from the United States Senators Lamar Alexander, a Republican of Tennessee, and Mark Warner, a Democrat of Virginia, and Representatives Tom Petri, Republican of Wisconsin, and David Price, Democrat of North Carolina. Their call to the Academy was to outline, quote, what are the top actions that Congress, state governments, universities, foundations, educators, individual benefactors, and others should take now to maintain national excellence in the humanities and social scientific scholarship education to achieve a long-term national goals for our intellectual and economic well-being, for a stronger, more vibrant civic society. Richard Broadhead, president of Duke University and a scholar of literature, and John Rowe, Chairman Emeritus of the Exelon Corporation, one of the nation's leading energy utility companies, co-chair a distinguished group uh, on the commission. Business, academia, working together, critical to our view of how we have to move not from our silos into a greater constructive interplay. Among the members of this commission are Pauline Yu, Annette Gordon-Reed, and Tony Grafton from the Humanities, social scientists Danielle Allen, Donna Shalala, Kathleen Hall Jamison, scientists and engineers, Charles Vest, Norm Augustine, John Hennessy, business leaders including Jim McNerney of Boeing and Roger Ferguson of TIA CREF, and leaders in the arts and media, George Lucas, Ken Burns, John Lithgow, Billy Chen, and David Brooks, quite a large number of Californians represented in this group. The commission members have been active and engaged in this work for over two years. They have also sponsored forums around the country to collect testimony about the importance of the humanities and social sciences to local and ethnic communities, to advance research, to civic participation, to the education continuum, and to the nation's defense and international relations. Let me show you a few snippets drawn the from these conversations. The nature of human beings um, is to understand that we've had a past, to recognize that we are living in a present, and to hope for a better future. And one has to, uh, therefore, be able to connect one's past to this present and uh, to have an anticipation of a better future one has to know something about how human beings have addressed the uh, big issues before us in the past, how they address them now, and uh, what the future might look like. And so, in a sense, the human humanities and the social sciences are the most uh, human of uh, inquiry because we are trying to understand that past, the relationship to the present, and the anticipation of the future. Something that has also really matters in America, where you can get students who are studying science who want to come into your literature class, that that still remains an aspect of the American Academy, which isn't the case in Europe. And I think it's something we really have to hold on to the idea that just because you want to become a doctor 
does not mean that you don't want to go down the corridor also and study the history of European painting. And that that has actually mattered in America. If it were lost, I think it would be an extraordinary loss, not only for the American Academy or for the individuals involved, but for the entire society. My tribe is known as a tribe of loss. In that loss, do we really realize what was taken away from us? In my opinion, it can be summarized in the word humanities. We have found that our people are not able to hold jobs because in many cases they don't know who they are, they don't have an identity, they have had a spirit taken away from them. And our success with our people comes when we are able to give that identity back to them, when we are able to give that spirit back to them, when we are able to give the humanities and provide them. My mom came to this country when we left Cuba. She was bringing her degree with her. They ripped it up at the airport and said that she was not taking even her education with her. However, it's ridiculous because your education is not that piece of paper. It, it is what has made you, what has formed you, what all the immigrants that have come to this country have brought with them and the strengths from their particular cultures that continues to weave their way into the fabric of this amazing nation that is growing by the day and with every immigrant that comes into this country, we acquire their knowledge, their skills, their culture, and adds to the amazing culture that already exists here. Perhaps ultimately uh, the, 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 the point is the promotion of that kind of, of tolerance, that degree of healthy self-doubt which, uh, which Learned Hand used to remind us of by quoting Oliver Cromwell uh, in, in his statement to the Scots, uh, consider that ye may be mistaken. Uh, in, in fact, as somebody reminded me as early as lunch today, uh, that after all was, was what Learned Hand called the spirit of liberty. Uh, and it's the spirit of liberty that the humanities are here to promote. As a society, we tend to focus on bad news, and bad news is all around us. The humanities community has had to struggle with bad news for decades. I will give you a few factoids. One third of all fourth graders in this country are reading even below a basic level of achievement. We do not compete well on international standards of reading. One third of public high school students take history classes with teachers who are neither certified nor degreed in history. Those people who have advocated for STEM well over the past several years have pointed out that math teachers needed more training. Actually, history teachers are even less well prepared than our math teachers. And federal funding to support international training and education has been cut by 41% in four years. This at a time when we have been involved in wars in multiple sites around the world. We are not training people in language. We're not training people in area studies. Uh, we are running around looking for somebody who can translate a text because we're not building it into either our primary, secondary, or advanced degree institutions. The Academy Commission has uncovered reasons for optimism, nevertheless. There is an interested public which is much broader and more diverse than they themselves thought. Over the past decades, many people in the humanities community looked at the scientific community and said, well, they've got their act together. Everybody's talking about STEM. Everybody's talking about the importance of science and technology, and we are being left off the page. The importance of the commission is to mobilize and draw on interested public to help move the policy community. You can't just talk about the bad data and hope that somebody in Washington is gonna say, okay, we'll fix it, if nobody across the country is saying it needs to be fixed. We need to mobilize PTAs and libraries, cultural institutions, all of those institutions that you all love and benefit from, and yes, business, government, and the military to help make our case. 
Last October, Academy Fellow Daniel Day Lewis introduced me to a young Army veteran named Johnny Jones. Johnny is in his late 20s, comes from the rural South, and lost both his legs in combat in Afghanistan. Daniel met Johnny while visiting Walter Reed Hospital while he was researching for his own role in Lincoln. As a result of that meeting, Johnny himself appeared in that moving hospital scene in the film, if you've seen the movie. Johnny's duty in Afghanistan was to find and defuse IEDs, dangerous, heroic work based on the purest form of technical knowledge. Daniel introduced us because Johnny is now interested in the humanities as a liberal studies major at Georgetown University. His military training taught him how to perform the tasks of his very dangerous assignment, but he will tell you Modern soldiers are statesmen as well as technical experts. For this reason, Johnny emphasized to me the importance of cultural knowledge, communication skills, historical perspective, and ethical reasoning for the modern military. He speaks eloquently about the importance of humanistic knowledge to his mission, and he said he only wished he had learned about the world in school before he enlisted. I remember Johnny Jones whenever I hear a governor, a senator, a superintendent, a parent, or even a student question the importance of disciplines like anthropology, or political science, or history, or the classics. The truth is we never know what piece of information will improve our security, our competitiveness, or our individual happiness. We never know which skills our next job will require. And so we will always need experts, teachers, and researchers to move the nation forward. And even those who are fraught with the job problems of today, looking for new jobs if they've been laid off, often can draw on their own sense of history and knowledge and enjoyment of literature as they are thinking about retooling for another profession. Since the publication of Rising Above the Gathering Storm in 19, 2007, which was a report of the National Academies, the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, have received necessary increases in funding and attention. But as Norm Augustine, former chairman of Lockheed Martin and head of the Gathering Storm report said at a recent meeting, quote, one cannot live by equations alone, unquote. Norm, of course, as chair of the Gathering Storm, is one of the nation's, chaired one of the nation's most influential reports on science. He is also a member of the Humanities Commission and equally dedicated to that work. One cannot live by equations alone. Note, I am not saying that this is a competition between STEM the humanities and social sciences. I'm saying this is an integrated problem. We need both. If you can't read, you can't do science. On the other hand, if you don't understand the meaning of how the scientific enterprise proceeds, critical thinking, evidence, you're not going to be able to be a good voter. So we need both together. Since that publication, the funding that STEM uh, sciences have received has been impressive, but we have to find ways to also advocate for the humanities. China and Singapore have discovered that a workforce trained in the humanities can be more creative and innovative. They are transforming their educational systems to include the study of literature and the arts. Peking University has even created a department of Western classics to better understand what the Chinese perceive as the bedrock of our economy and culture and other nations are following. Even British colleges have, have developed long, they, the British system is very narrow. They have, in recent years, rediscovered the liberal arts. This year, King's College London and University College London are both admitting undergraduates to new programs in the liberal arts. Why are we divesting from broad education when others who have envied our system of ed education for a century are moving in that direction. Is this the way we're going to be competitive? 
I ask you. In a re recent survey of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, 78% of employees responded that they preferred job applicants knowledgeable about global issues and societies and cultures outside the U.S. to train them for a global workforce. 80% favored employees with strong written and oral communication skills. And 82% responded that they preferred employees with civic knowledge, skills, and judgment. All of these are honed in the bedrock of the humanities. In other words, the humanities community has a world out there of allies, whether it's our military or it's our uh, business community or our wish to be part of a, glo a competitive global environment. But those in the humanities community have got to join this argument. And I wonder if humanists themselves have been aggressive enough both to find a common voice and then to work with these other constituents to argue that our senators and congressmen are missing something. The Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences and the campaign that will follow the release of the report will attempt to restore balance to the public conversation about American education. We're embarking on a journey that will not end with the report, but rather enunciate a set of principles that we're calling on all of you to help us carry forward. So when you listen to some of the testimonies uh, of earlier, whoops, of earlier um, forums that the Academy held, I hope you're inspired to think about what kind of forums you could hold right here at UC Davis, because we intend to ha work with humanities centers around the country and with other interested publics to try to get this conversation actively going in our society. And uh, the report is meant to be provocative of what would be lost if we didn't have the humanities and social sciences. Let me share with you a few basic principles of our work. One, the humanities and social sciences provide Americans with the knowledge, skills, and understanding they will need to thrive in a modern, increasingly complex, technologically-based society. For example, reading, writing, speaking, and analytic skills are the basis of career flexibility and lifelong knowledge. To, that the knowledge of history, civics, and social sciences will allow people to participate meaningfully in democracy. And without that knowledge, democracy cannot thrive. Think of the societies and countries when they were most eager not to have a democratic nation remove the university, remove the culture. Think of what is done subtly when we don't fund culture and we don't fund learning. It's self-removal. It's a, a very perverse idea. Finally, the qualities of mind, problem solving, critical analysis, and communication skills are common to all disciplines. The humanities and social sciences equip the nation for leadership in an interconnected world. They teach us about ourselves and about others. They enable us to participate in the global economy that requires understanding of diverse languages and cultures and sensitivities to many perspectives. They make it possible for people around the world to work together to address issues such as environmental sustainability and global health. Three. State and federal research and education budgets are currently stretched to fund more programs with fewer dollars, and they need, we need a wider community of philanthropic individuals and foundations to invest in the humanities and social sciences beyond government. Four, we need to bring the humanities communities together to argue for the importance of these disciplines, as I suggested earlier. Each organization within the complex tapestry of the humanities and social sciences has a message. I hope that we can find some common messages as well as our individual messages. Each organization has a role in advancing the recommendations of the report. And we need to find a way to bring the whole education continuum together from teachers of preschool to those doing advanced research in universities and uh, institutes of advanced knowledge. Finally, teachers, scholars, 
have to reevaluate the curriculum, pre-K through college, not in small boxes, but what are the competencies we hope young people will learn that they can build on to be more successful in high school, what do we hope people will learn in high school that will translate to college? We do a lot of costly remedial work in our country, which might be a place where we can actually begin to save some money if we created a clearer continuum between the sectors and welcome more actively in some institutions those people who are teaching in the earlier years. Finally, we need to have engage with a broader public. Not every humanist or social scientist needs to be a public intellectual. But scholars have got to address many audience and they need to find ways to justify their work to larger audiences. As historian Anthony Grafton and Jim Grossman, executive director of the American Historical Association, wrote in an influential essay, No More Plan B. In other words, the academic community must not see the value of their degree, their advanced degree, only in replicating themselves. There aren't going to be a glut of jobs available to be filled. People going through these disciplines have the right for their own faculty to work with them to think about the other things they might profitably do and how the whole society will benefit from their advanced training. We can no longer believe that our work is just reproduction, but also as contributors to the public culture and the private sector. Your humanities clusters here in the center are valuable models of this kind of interdisciplinary work, and I applaud you for it, and I think it's just the kind of thing that all undergraduates and graduate students will find a new sense of the value of their work and their disciplines. Most of all, the Commission wants to maintain the exemplary system of broad liberal arts education that is our nation's greatest export and calls for increased support for humanistic and social science research in every field. The larger funding problem will not be solved by making louder requests where there is little inclination to and fewer dollars to give. As my colleague and the co-chair of the committee, the commission, Dick Broadhead, said, quote, the slogan, we have a value and you are apparently just not able to understand it, unquote, is not a winner in the contest for public opinion. <laughs> Scholars in the humanities and social sciences must begin to learn from the biological and physical sciences that they have been success, that they have to make the case as STEM has for building over the last 50 years since the creation of the National Science Foundation. Now it's 63 years since that creation. This is not easy to do. The humanities and social sciences are, of course, the disciplines of debate and dissent, and we would not want it otherwise, but they have, they abhor slogans, and they cannot cure cancer or even blight in vines. But let us not forget that music and wine and letters make the most worthwhile life companions. As James Madison continued in this, his reflections on liberty and learning, he said, quote, throughout the civilized world, nations are courting the praise of fostering science and the useful arts, unquote. Madison was concerned that if we were gonna compete young America with Europe when he wrote these words, and we'd have to find a way to uh, <coughs> achieve what they were achieving in Europe. Today, we look to developments in China and other Asian nations, all of whom have now acknowledged the benefits of our kind of work, and we cannot afford to lose what we have already made us great. Thank you. Leslie, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. On, I think I'm not the only person in this room. I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who had an almost visceral, felt a visceral resonance with what you were saying about uh, many of the themes that you presented today. The importance of, the fundamental importance of curiosity driven creative endeavor. That is truly one of our unique human attributes. 
but also you're pushing us. You're pushing us to get out of our comfort zones, to, to reach out not only to other disciplines, say from STEM disciplines into the arts, uh, and certainly the social sciences, but also from just trying to influence our, our co-scholars, our fellow scholars, to having an impact on society. So thank you. Uh, we're all incredibly grateful to the work that American Academy of Arts and Sciences is do doing to champion the importance of higher education while also changing us. Now I come from a STEM background and, and I, to me, the notion that STEM can or should operate in any sort of isolation from the social sciences and the humanities is really kind of hard to fathom. You know, from just a biological or scientific standpoint, humanity is the most important ecological force on Earth. It is the most, it is changing the geochemistry of our planet, the evolution of every species on our planet. How can we possibly understand those processes unless we understand human beings and our social systems? And those are the domains of arts and humanities. So thank you. I think it's an incredible message. Um, I also feel, and I, I want to address, come back to a theme that you mentioned in your talk, and that is, has to do with how education in the K through 12 level, how we need to reach out uh, there. I, I feel, I sort of call our current system, the system of leave no child untested. Uh, <laughs> and, and yet even as I, as I feel things have gotten much worse, I think of my own uh, childhood where I didn't become a scientist because of the science classes I had in high, junior high or high school. What they taught me about the scientific method sounded so incredibly dull and boring. Who would ever want to do that? Where was the role of creativity? Similarly, I didn't feel I was well prepared for realizing that history teaches us uh, about the future <laughs> and that arts aren't just decorative, but they are probing ourselves. Uh, so given that, I'd really appreciate if you talk to us a little bit about what you think we can do or should do. What can we do to help break down these, this, these comfort zones, break down these disciplinary boundaries for uh, younger students, the teachers who are teaching them? Well, I was, in, in our commission report, we were very concerned with how each segment of the educational system lives within its own culture. Uh, so school teachers, who are many of whom have college and even master's degrees to be school teachers, go out of the system and we no longer think of them as fellow academics, trying to bring to high school and then college the kind of people who can uh, be successful in our institutions. Uh, they don't even talk about the humanities in K through 12. The humanities are uh, a higher education construction, I think. Uh, the, or an, a national construction when the NEH was created. In, high in grammar school, we talk about reading, we talk about social studies, uh, which I think combines history and civics, although uh, one of those awful factoids is that civics isn't being taught anymore in, in at least more than half of the states in this country. Uh, they, uh, languages, foreign languages, which we consider part of the humanities, uh, is absent in the schools. Now, s each level of education, to some extent, is influenced by the one beyond it. I don't, if the medical schools stopped requiring organic chemistry as an entrance criteria, I wonder what would happen to the enrollment in organic chemistry. For years, I always thought it was the organic chemist who stood between a, a child's aspiration to be a doctor and their ability to get there. And I always wondered what criteria they were using, uh, as the course always seemed beyond my ability. Um, the, similarly, if co colleges some years ago gave up looking for foreign languages, so why are we surprised that high schools hard put to meet their curriculum would offer fewer foreign languages. Uh, if 
uh, grammar schools could prepare the way, not in this endless, it's STEM or, but mm -hmm. a series of competencies and literacies that people need to be successful, uh, then I think uh, we could work together on it. It would be interesting for a university curriculum committee to get a few high school teachers to come and even chat about it. Uh, it would be interesting to have uh, graduate school faculties talk candidly, both from the, not just in the disciplines of the humanities and social sciences, but in the medical and law and business schools about what these aspirations are. I often hear the opposite on the, of this. Oh, humanities are important, so our medical school has an ethics course. Or business is so important, we're in, we, we are even offering some intercultural courses for, that's late. Mm. Medical schools should be down there encouraging K through 12. The PTA, parents, should be looking for this in our schools. The arts are no longer in our schools. Now, I, I know I'm being rather um, optimistic when I understand that the budgets of public education have been cut and in many cities and states are so tied to the real estate uh, taxes and, and people are aging and as they age they're not interested in having higher real estate taxes so some group of five-year-olds will have arts in the school but the long-term result of not giving that kind of opportunity to each next generation will create a very bifurcated society in which those people who have affluence will be able to provide some of these opportunities by taking their kids after school to museums, introducing the arts, and others supplementing the school. Most of the supplementing to schools I see around me are for sports. I see far less for far, except if you come from certain cultures for foreign language or for uh, other disciplinary ideas. And I think we've got to get back in our schools. We've got to have the public will that we will not be in a society where affluence creates a bifurcated society and an elitist group who have that kind of culture and the rest who schools couldn't afford it. So it, it, it comes back to really an economic. Now I don't like to see teachers um, not have the opportunity to come to lectures. There are, I mean, we run lectures at the academy. Not every chair at every lecture is filled. Where are the school teachers coming yeah. to our lectures, feeling like they're not just guests because we're having us take a teacher to lunch program, but take a teacher into our departments, adopt them, care about them? It'd be amazing what they could do. I, I think they must be so time limited. I know I tried to do an outreach mm -hmm. uh, program on evolution uh, uh, about five or six years ago. We really worked hard to invite teachers from the Davis and Sacramento school districts, we couldn't get any. And I don't know how much of that was because they're just so busy. They are, their class sizes are huge, their workload is tremendous. And how much of it may be a perceived separation, that we were being condescending somehow, or it's, we expect that to be a one-way conversation instead of a two-way conversation. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's tremendously important. Can you imagine a tenure committee having a high school teacher on it? Would <laughs> that would be, be a two-way conversation. That would be interesting. I, I, I do think, I've, I've told many of my colleagues, many of my graduate students, that if you really understand the importance of your work, you should be able to explain it to an intelligent fourth grader. And, and that if you can distill it to that level, then you really have a, a better grasp of what you're trying to do. And if we paid our school teachers adequately and yeah. we honored them adequately, as some countries do, then those people who are finishing PhDs in disciplines might feel very happy to be teaching as a career, which is what they said they wanted to do. But if you go into a school system where everything's meted out to you and you're not well paid and you're judged by some body taking tests every day, then that's not a profession that people want to go into. So we've got to fix that somehow. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I want to make sure we have time for questions, uh, but I want to just ask one more thing. Thinking about the, the work of the commission, what an amazing group. You read us a set of the 52 names, humanists, social scientists, business leaders. Um, 
And I, I personally, the story about Daniel Day-Lewis and Johnny Jones really uh, caught me. I, how, what, a, what an important realization to realize that the modern soldier has to be a statesperson, a diplomat, uh, and therefore needs to know history, cultural competencies, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you, as you listened to these discussions and read drafts of the report, what were some of the other arguments that these, uh, particularly that this gr diverse group of stakeholders made to really call for the importance of continued investment in humanities and social sciences? I'd love to hear some of those stories. Well, there was a lot of discussion about civics, and one of the interesting discussions was about what kind of a jury would you like if you were suddenly mm. found yourself being tried by a, 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 your peers, and how would you like it if they didn't know how to think deductively, understand critically and, and uh, logically the arguments, and make a considered decision, and that training in civics in literacy and in the scientific method would be very helpful for jurists. And uh, I was very persuaded that I wouldn't want to go before a jury that was emotional. And uh, I have to say, I served on an almost month-long jury about six years ago. And it was a civil trial. The jurors, all of the jurors except for three of us, were under 35. There were three of us over 50. The key point of the trial was whether someone who had a serious injury would be likely a number of years later to have a re-experience of the injury. There was expert testimony on this, very convincing, top person in the field, et cetera, et cetera. But he wasn't a very nice man. He was, looked, he was not well prepared as a, as a witness. And it ended up the three people over 50 were in support of the plaintiff, and the rest, the majority of the jury, just could not see the evidence. Said, this guy's an expert. We don't care. We don't trust him. It it was it was tough. So, um, evidence-based decisions yes. is one very important part of our jury system. You also mentioned George Lucas and oh, something George about uh, the whys right. of technology. George George said that technology teaches us how, and the humanities teaches us why, but he talked very convincingly at commission meetings about the importance of learning history, because he said even cinema studies is based on knowing the history of the discipline of film, and as well as the history of our society. And anyone who's ever watched the beginning of the trilogy knows that in a far distant land, uh, that. Lucas was talking very much about the sweep of Western culture and history, mm -hmm. so in modern terms. Thank you very Thank much. You. And what I'd like to do is bring the house lights up a little bit, if we can, uh, and just open up uh, the meeting to questions for Leslie. I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on how Common Core is going to affect um, the humanities with just so many states in the nation rolling that out um, and all the testing that's going to be done on computers with that and the technology piece that's really being pushed that goes with that for the K through um, 12 schools. A number of the members of the commission felt strongly that the, the Common Core was a very good effort by the governors to begin to think what are the competencies we would like young people to have. Uh, I think it's yet to be told how well the testing will support the uh, success of the core because um, if students don't do very well on it over time, will it be sustained politically? And the notion that judging it by the first set of tests or the second set of tests, rather than having the patience to see that people will get better at it over time, and rather than, gee, the headline I could imagine, 80% of the students failed the test in X. And so then becomes, what does a governor do? Put more money and more money to make sure they all pass? Or do we say, well, as it has happened in some states recently, we're eliminating that test. So I don't 
might personally like to see all of education based on testing. Uh, some people test well in some ways, and other people do well orally. It's more expensive. They have different modes of learning. And so I think it's a right, we, the commission applauds the effort, but wonders how patient we will be to really embed it in our system. Great, great question. Uh, I'm, I'm Margie Ferguson, and I'm in the English department, and I'm also going to be the incoming president of the MLA, the Modern Language Association, in December. And we have a new committee called K through 16 that is addressing just this. But um, I'm particularly concerned, I've been reading Diane Ravitch's um, objections to the Common Core, not just to the question of will we have enough patience to sustain it, but also to the very certain parts of the Common Core having to do with language arts, which James Coleman has really made a strong distinction between information-rich texts and fiction. And the, ch the changer, you're going to see it right in your kids' K, K and three cla classes, that there will be less, fewer stories, and more what is defined as informational, mm. nonfiction. But um, in, in my fields, we question that distinction because we think reading has to include things in many genres. And the other part of the Common Core that is so um, depressing to those of us who work in language and literature is that foreign languages are not part of the language arts. They seem to be being handed over to um, the defense department and the <laughs> definitions of what are strategically important languages. So it seems to me we didn't have a very long discussion of the Common Core, and we didn't have too much bottom-up discussion of it before it was instituted, and is now at the stage of being impl implemented. So I wonder if, if your commission, I, I agree, it would be wonderful to be teaching competencies and to have college teachers talk to high school teachers about what the expectations are and also what could be done, but it seems the train has already left the station, and um, I'm not as optimistic as it sounds like some members of your commission well, some are. members of the commission felt that it was really an important effort. I believe candidly that what moves all of us most of all is stories. Mm -hmm. Children start to tell stories when they're very little and they are fa readers are always fascinated by stories of places long ago and far away and that's the way you learn and so I certainly agree with the MLA about their concerns. Uh, I also know that the academic uh, societies were not always forthcoming when, for example, history tried to develop a course some years ago, and there was a real tension between the history community and the testing community, and I think we can't, we have to roll up our sleeves and go get part of it and not wait till it happens to us. So I'm not saying that I like everything about what's evolved, and I think it's terrific that you've got a K through 16 effort, pre-K even, whereas reading readiness is so important. Uh, and I do think it's a very important challenge for the MLA and the AHA and others to you know, get involved in a, what is a pretty messy system. I have no doubt that in the end people will really resonate to the stories more than anything else. So I hope literature will get restored, and I was worried about the same thing you are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe. Thank you.